Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Messianic Bible Study with me, Zeli. So uh, I'm continuing Oh, uh, the tagline. I have to say that. Where we take every verse of the Bible seriously. And so um, I'm continuing the series uh, talking about um, the, I guess, the videos that Mike Winger put out about uh, messianicism and uh, well he challenged us to uh, have some sort of commentary on Hebrews especially Hebrews 8 verse 13 in context and so um, that's what I'm doing and you know as I mentioned in the first uh, episode of the Hebrews commentary there are other commentaries out there David Stern, uh, that guy, I think David Lancaster from First Fruits of Zion. Like there, there are other messianic commentaries out there on the Book of Hebrews um, in its entirety, and there are especially commentaries out there on Hebrews eight thirteen. I disagree with most of them because I'm a messianic, and that's what we do. So you know, I'm doing my own. Uh, so. Uh, Last week, we actually got started in he in in what's called what I think is the bulk section, like the actual context for Hebrews eight thirteen, and it's the uh, inclusio that begins in Hebrews four fifteen, or I guess four fourteen, and then it ends in Hebrews ten twenty five, and so this is the main inclusio, and, and um, I'm using uh, George Guthrie's sort of uh breakdown of hebrews here so um uh, uh, barry jocelyn in his book hebrews christ and the law he's actually the one who does uh, who goes through george guthrie's uh time not timeline i guess not breakdown i'm trying to trying to think of the word what is it it's when uh you outline outline that's the word so uh Barry Jocelyn is the one that goes through George Guthrie's outline, and he talks about specifically Hebrews 4, 14 through 10, 25, and uh, talks about how this is one inclusio. So uh, like one big one, and it's broken up into basically two pieces. Uh, the first piece is Hebrews 4, 14 to uh, Hebrews 7, 28. That's the first piece. And then there's like a door hinge in a way or a hinge phrase that is uh, Hebrews 8, 1, and 2. And that's sort of where you switch from one broad topic to another broad topic. And the first broad topic is basically proving that Jesus is the heavenly high priest that we need in order for our consciences to be cleansed. The second broad piece is talking about uh, more the entrance of the new covenant and what that means, how it, how uh, it was brought in, and sort of what sort of changes we can expect in the life of a believer. And that's that whole section, uh, second section. So that's sort of what I will be talking about. Uh, th that's the the broad context, the broad uh, um, paradigm that I'll be using when I'm doing this breakdown of Hebrews. So that's where we'll begin. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since you have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's approach to the throne, uh, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. So this is an opening phrase, and it tells us a few things about who Jesus is, what he does. So uh, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, so where is Jesus? He's in the heavens. He's passed through the heavens. And that's going to be really important to think about when you're uh, dealing with 
the distinctions between Jesus and the Levitical priesthood and just who he, who he is in in all of the ways that we study that Jesus the son of God let's hold firmly to our confession so because we have this high priest we can hold firmly to our confession whose confession the confession of the church um especially the one that Hebrews is referring to or or talking to for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are yet without sin so there's some sort of temptation going on that the author of Hebrews is talking about we're not entirely sure what it is um i talked last week about david stern in his commentary on hebrews he thinks that the temptation is to go back to the sacrificial system uh the levitical sacrificial system and i entirely disagreed with him because it, temptation to sin means temptation to break what god's law says and so if your temptation is to do more of what god tells you to do that's not really a temptation that's just doing good so so uh kind of a silly thing for him to say in my opinion so anyway he is a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are so what's the temptation was jesus tempted to go back to the levitical sacrificial system no he was not why because he did it that he, he just he just did it and then when he died he wasn't like oh, I, I died, I, I paid for the sins, I have replaced the sacrificial system, and then when he rose again, he uh, tried going back to the sacrificial system. That's not what the temptation was. Jesus, being tempted in all things like us, therefore he can sympathize with our weaknesses. So, um, the temptation that we are talking about, the reason that we are supposed to hold firmly to our confession and not fall into this temptation is not about the Levitical priesthood or the, the sacrificial system. Um, I'm thinking it's probably about rejecting Jesus. And there's a variety of reasons which we will hopefully get into in this episode today. So that's part of the opening paragraph or the opening set of sentences for this inclusio. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for, the, for help at the time of our need. What's that about? Well, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence. What is that? Approach means to sacrifice. The throne of grace is the temple. With confidence, meaning not timidly or with timidity. So that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. What's that for? Well, he's talking about people who already have our confession. So this isn't talking about new believers. So if you are a Calvinist or, or some sort of Reformed theologian, to receive mercy and find grace is not about entering into the faith. To receive mercy and find grace is for once you are already once you are already in the faith, what happens after that? Well, you still need mercy and you still need to find grace. Why? Because uh, we have times of need. We have temptations we have sins and we still need to seek god's favor and uh mercy and that's really important because uh it, there are going to be certain areas in this in the book of hebrews where it talks about sin and it talks about what the job of jesus is regarding sin and what the job of the levitical priesthood is regarding sin and you're going to see a sharp distinction drawn between the two. When we approach the throne of grace with confidence, so when we go to the temple to offer our sacrifices, that is, we are doing that so we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. This is not about, uh, well, I mean, you could say it's about sin, but this one specifically says for grace or for help at the time of our need. This is about asking God to uh, remove trials from you or to uh give you a blessing this is about asking for god's favor specifically for those things now maybe it's still about sin about the sins that you commit once you enter into the family of god but it, that's not what's directly being spoken of right here and so 
this gives us a hint about what we're going to be looking at. So Jesus is our great high, high priest who's in heaven. Therefore, we should hold firmly to our confessions because he sympathizes with us and he, he has been tempted in the way that we have been tempted. He hasn't sinned, but he understands why we would. And therefore, let's offer our sacrifices in the temple uh, that will go straight to him so that we may receive mercy and grace during our time of trouble and need. That's the beginning of this inclusio. So let's continue. Uh, Hebrews 5, and I'll just read the, the whole chapter. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of people in things pertaining to God in order to, to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is clothed in weakness. And because of it, he is ob obligated to offer sacrifices for sins for himself as well as for the people. And no one takes the honor for himself, but receives it when he is called by God, just as Aaron also was. So too, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have fathered you. Just as he also says in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Pardon me. In the days of his humanity, he offered up both prayers and pleas with loud cries and tears to the one able to save him. Whoops. From death, and he was heard because of his devout behavior. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become poor listeners, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to distinguish between good and evil. So uh, we're going to be getting started here. Um, I'm I actually so this is where my notes kind of begin on uh, the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to switch over to my notes, and this will be how we do it. So the first verse for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of people in things pertaining to god in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins so the the high priest is taken from among men is appointed on behalf of people uh, in things pertaining to god in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins so the this section introduces the general principle that the priest is appointed to do two things act on behalf of men in relation to God, that's the first thing, and to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So this should not be seen as an exhaustive list of things that the priesthood does because the duties of the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, range far more broadly than this. Um, for instance, the Aaronic priesthood was to teach the law to the people. Leviticus 10, 11, and Malachi 2, 7, they were supposed to judge the people. Um, and offer the various non-sin offerings on the altar. So those are at least three things. They're also supposed to offer uh, the census. They're supposed to uh, act as judges. They're supposed to do a litany of other things that is not uh, related in this verse of Hebrews 5.1. Um, uh, so uh, appointed on behalf of people in things pertaining to God in order to both offer uh, to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So to relate to people in things pertaining to God, that's basically like being a medium of worship. So God ordained the Levitical priesthood as a medium by which we come in order to uh, bring our pleas to God. Now, there's a really interesting, I guess, philosophical question here. And the question is, if God is everywhere, why does he need a place? Like, if God is the father of all people, as Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being, um, 
why did he choose Israel? And I think that's a really important question because it's like he is, yeah, on the one hand, the father of everybody. He created all mankind. Everyone subsists on him. But then at the same time, he chose Israel specifically. And then there's another thing. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. So why did he choose to dwell in a single place, in a temple? Well, these are things that, that are, are interesting, but um, the answer to these things, well, I mean, you can't really come up with a specific answer to these things, I think, but it does say that he did choose to dwell in these places, and he chose these places uh, as mediums to perform certain actions. So if you wanted to, let's say, ask a question of God and it had a yes or no answer, well, God gave us the Urim and the Thummim, where you can go to the priest and ask him a specific question, and God will speak through the Urim and the Thummim. Could he speak to the person audibly, directly? Sure. He spoke to Balaam through a donkey. So then why did he choose the Urim and the Thummim? That's his prerogative to choose one thing versus another. Um, could we perform? Why did he choose that specific place to bring our offerings to? Could we? Could we bring our like? Would he receive our offerings if they were from any other place? Well, Abraham offered offerings to God in like four different locations. The original sacrifice to God to inaugurate the Old Covenant, the Sinaitic Covenant, was at Mount Sinai, which is not Mount Zion. So, yeah, God can, but it's his prerogative to choose this place. Could God minister to everybody through everybody? Yeah, he could. But it's his prerogative to choose specific people, to minister to people. And it's his prerogative to choose from among men the Levitical priest uh, to offer offerings on behalf of the people and bring their uh, pleas to God, their petitions, and all the other things that they um, that they do now there's also a really interesting distinction here um there's how oh man i'm forgetting the phrase the it's it's uh ah oh man i just read this article it's really interesting phrase that this guy uses um basically is the okay the prescription does the prescription or, or do the prescription and the description match this isn't the phrase but i'm 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 riffing here so do the prescription and the description match so god gives a prescription now is that connected to the nature of of reality the answer is actually not obvious um, on the one hand, you can say that it's not connected to the nature of reality. So, for instance, uh, this is found in the egalitarianism debate. Um, if God if God does make the sexes complementary to each other as opposed to um, being egalitarian, then does that mean that they are equal in every single way, but God just, in in subversion of nature, chooses one versus another? Or does it mean that God instilled within the nature of male and female differences that also match the prescription that he gives to them? And I'm inclined to believe that more often than not, the prescription matches the description. But sometimes it's like, well, Aaron and the Le Levites, they're just like any other tribe. And so why would God choose them over the others? The answer there actually is a bit more interesting. It's more that the Levitical priesthood was given their priesthood because, let's see, probably because of their connection to Moses and their obedience to God. Aaron was given his priesthood. It, the Bible doesn't actually tell us why, but it does tell us basically before he was given his priesthood, he was 
one of the closest people to Moses, and he obeyed God fully. Like whatever God said, he did. And so he was given his priesthood before the sin of the golden calf. And even after the sin of the golden calf, he did not actually break from that. So, um, or God didn't break his priesthood from him. So there is some sort of merit, mer meritoriousness or meritocracy that God uh, gave to him and his descendants after him. So, I mean, if you're a descendant of Aaron, you have the capacity to be a priest by the merit of your father, Aaron, and not by your own merit, which is really interesting. Vicarious atonement is uh, uh, has its has sort of typology there in a way. Okay, so verse one, let's move on. Verses two through three, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is clothed in weakness and because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins for himself as well as the people. So this is talking about the Levitical priests. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. Now it's interesting because if you go back to uh, chapter four, verse uh, like what we were just talking about, Jesus is able to sympathize because he was subject to the same weaknesses and, temp and temptations. And Aaron is able to deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. So there's kind of like uh, an interesting parallel here. Like the purpose of priest is to deal gently or to uh, uh, to sympathize with the people who are coming to uh, ask them, like bringing their petitions to them. So that's part of like the parallel. Both of them do that. This one, so Jesus is able to sympathize with all people. Aaron is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided. So there's a bit of a, I guess, ignorant and misguided would be the people who need to learn and the people who, I guess, have sinned in a way. And that's part of, uh, so what we mentioned just now, um, he, the, the Aaronic priesthood was to teach the law to the people, Leviticus 10, 11. And so that's part of what Aaron's job is, and it describes it right here, basically, since he himself also is clothed in weakness. And because of it, he's ob obligated to offer sacrifices for sins for himself, as well as for the people. And so this is interesting because it does parallel Hebrews uh, 4.15, but Hebrews 4.15 is part of the introduction to this inclusio. This, uh, Hebrews 5.2, is part of the opening to the expositional section. So uh, George Guthrie, he breaks down um, Hebrews into two basic sections that alternate between each other. You have the expositional set sections, and you have the um, hortatory sections. In the expositional sections, he's, you know, just laying out some uh, um, propositions. He's saying, if this, then this, then this, then this. It's all about teaching up here. The hortatory sections start to talk about, like, because of this, what are you doing, guys? Why are you being so dumb? to paraphrase. And so this is part of uh, one of the expositional sections. It is not part of the introduction of the inclusio. That is in uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. This is part of the introduction to the first expositional section. So let me see here. And so I, I guess let's just move on. Verses five through six. Oh, wait. Yeah, verses five through six. So too Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but it was he who said of him, you are my son, today I've fathered you. Just as he also says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, of course, Christ didn't, glorify himself he humbled himself 
and uh, uh, it was God the Father who said, you are my son, today I have fathered you. And he says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So it's God who's offering the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is one of the first mentions of Melchizedek. We mentioned it before. There was a, one prior mention in the book of Hebrews. But this begins to explain what exactly Christ has as a priesthood. It's the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that's gonna, that distinction is going to be important later. Um, so verse the verses here that are referenced at first were given to David or the king. And so that's really interesting. David had the Melchizedekian priesthood at, at, in his day. And he also had, he was considered the son of God uh, because he was the king. But it demonstrates two things. First, that there have been other Melchizedeks. That's the first thing. And second, that these Melchizedeks have ministered alongside the Levitical priesthood before. And the reason this is important is because a lot of times we think of the Melchizedek priesthood as uh, superseding the Levitical priesthood, or that the two are like in competition with each other. But this is belied by the actual biblical evidence. They almost never are in competition with each other. The only time they are is when people start going to the Levitical priesthood for things that they should be going to the Melchizedek priesthood for, and vice versa. That's the only time they're in conflict with each other. But most of the time through throughout Scripture, they are not in conflict with each other. And that's really important for us to understand. Um, they operated simultaneously in the Old Testament, and there's no reason to believe that, they would, that this would change in the New Testament. Um, and so if it were the case that you would have the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, and then the Melchizedek priesthood would come and subvert the Levitical priesthood, and then the Levitical priesthood would come again and subvert the Melchizedek king priesthood, then you could say, yeah, the two are in competition. When you have one, you don't have the other, And when, rather than having them both simultaneously. But because that's not the case in the Hebrew Bible, there's no reason to assume that that would be the case in the New Testament either, or in the New Covenant. And so Jesus, having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all of those who obey him. So the, uh, I mentioned last week about the sort of more conservative wing of early Christianity, that you have faith and grace, but those are not distinct from works. Faith and works were basically just the same thing. They're indistinguishable. And here... Uh, you you get a bit of evidence for that. So having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for those who obey him. Not for those who believe in him, but for those who obey him. And why? He's not disagreeing with Paul here. He is simply assuming that obedience and faith are the same thing. And so that's Hebrews 5. Let's see. Then, okay, so... Uh, so, and having been, okay, so uh, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So, that's Jesus. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become poor listeners. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God, and you have need to, uh, you have come to need milk and not solid food. And so, what are these elementary principles? We're actually going to hear about them. Um, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. What is the word of righteousness? Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to distinguish between good and evil. So the word of righteousness, what is that? Meaning, by practice, you have been able to distinguish between good and evil. The word of righteousness is like practicing obedience and then learning to distinguish between what is obedient and what is disobedience. And so Hebrews 6 continues with this line of reasoning. 
It begins, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame for ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and produces vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So I'm just going to read this first section here because this this is still, well, all of this uh, entire chapter six is part of the hortatory section. So what are these elementary principles? These elementary principles are really interesting because they lay down the process that you would do if you are going up to the temple. These elementary principles are probably not an exhaustive list. They're probably just the list that they need in order to go to the temple. So what are they? The foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Now, if you are a Christian and you think that the temple was the place where you repented, that is wrong. And if you read, for instance, the Mishnah, it'll tell you everywhere that in order for you to go to the temple, you first have to repent. Before you even think about going, before you select your, your lamb that you're going to slaughter, repent before you go. And then what? And then about washings. Now, this is interesting because it's plural. So do you need to wash multiple times? Do you need to get baptized multiple times? Well, depends on what you mean by baptism. And this is going to be the one of the primary distinctions that we make in the book of Hebrews. Washings, like, so the, the, when you first enter into the faith, you get baptized. And that's part of the sanctification process for you to become a fully, like, a full member of the people of God. You get baptized. And this is sort of an initial washing. Now, most Christians have no idea what it's for. There's something about, like, a metaphor for death, burial, and resurrection or something like that. But it's, yeah, there is that. But why wash? Why not do some other thing that represents death, burial? If if the metaphor was really the important thing, then why not just do something else that represents that metaphor? Well, the the reason that you're, you, you get baptized in water is because that's what Scripture says is the mechanism for becoming clean. You're not getting baptized because water uh, gives you any sort of forgiveness of sins. You're getting baptized because you're entering into a people, a clean people, and part of cleanliness is physical cleanliness. And so your baptism is changing your identity from physical defilement to physical cleanliness. And there's this uh, tracted in the Mishnah. Um, I have it referenced later in my notes, but I, I, I don't remember exactly um, where it is. So we'll get to it when we get to it. But it mentions how when someone enters into the faith, they have to get baptized no matter what. And the reason for that is because they're coming from a place, from an identity of uncleanness to an identity of cleanness. And it's the same thing in Christianity. That's what the washings are for. Now, it's plural because there aren't just one washing. This is not talking about your first baptism that you enter into the faith of God for. This is talking about the baptism that you do before you go to the temple. So if you go to the temple, you would repent from your sins. Then you would reach the pool. Um, I think it's the Pool of Siloam. But I could be wrong. It's... Uh, right before the uh, you, you take the steps to actually go up to the temple. Then you immerse in that, you do your mikvah, 
and then you go up to the temple because you have been fully cleansed. That's what these washings are. Why would you need to wash multiple times? We're not Anabaptists here. The reason is because it's not talking about baptism. It's talking about the, the regular mikvah that you do in order to maintain your physical cleanliness. What about the laying on of hands? Well, there are two things here. Um, if you're thinking very broadly about, um, like, like if, if you're thinking that these principles, these elementary principles are just really broad principles, and I, and I did at one point, but now I don't think that, then you might think laying on of hands is talking about the, uh, uh, I think, semicha, I think that's the, word, the term, the ordination process from up one person down to another. That's, I don't think, the case. Now, it could be referring to that if Hebrews is talking to people who might enter the priesthood. And so you could even read this in that way. So uh, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Aaron had to repent from all of his dead works. And then he had to wash, like when he was being ordained, he had to, to wash himself and stay in the temple for seven days. And then once he stayed in the temple for seven days and purified himself, Moses would lay his hands on Aaron and the ordination would be uh, complete. And then the reason that that is important is because then you have the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Once you're a priest, what is it important for you to know? Don't do things wrong because there's a judgment and you don't take this job lightly. That's if, if Hebrews is, is talking to a priest. If he's talking to a regular person, then it's just do the regular things that you do before you go to the temple. Repent from your dead works. Uh, do the mikvah and then go up, offer the sacrifice. And what happens when you offer the sacrifice, the priest rests his hand on the, the offering that he's slaughtering. And so do, so do you. Both of you uh, rest your hand on the, um, the lamb or goat or bull or heifer. And so that's part of the laying on of hands. There's sort of a transference of uncleanness or a transference of, of sin, to so to speak. And then about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, there... I was going to say something, but I, um, I'm not entirely clear on it, so I will not. But the thing is, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment are elementary principles, specifically when you're repenting from your sins, because those are very, very salient when you're repenting from your sins. Why are you repenting? Well, there's re resurrection of the dead. There's new life. You're not dead and gone forever. Um, you're going to have to pay for your sins one way or another. Um, what about uh, eternal judgment? Well, that's God in Malachi. God opens the books, and he judges every person according to their deeds. And if their deeds have been wiped clean by their repentance, then they don't have to enter into uh, they, they don't have to enter into purgatory. But if their sins have not been completely wiped clean, then you know there's a purgation process. And so we, uh, so the author here says, we will not lay again this foundation if God permits, the end of verse 3 here. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have t tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So this is really interesting. So why is it important that we don't talk about the elementary principles? Because we're talking about the really important ones here. Uh, because it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, in those who have at once received the Spirit of God, who have learned from the Word of God, who have tasted of the heavenly gifts, the spiritual gifts, or the Eucharist, uh, or the, the sacrifices, and have made been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and, the, and have taste, tasted of the power of the age to come. And then fall, having fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. 
So this is interesting. And this um, opens up a, a point that I'm going to talk about again later. So if somebody falls away, what does it mean to fall away? It means to exit the faith. And to restore them again, or, or to stop being part of the family of God. Now, this does not mean that somebody just makes some sort of propositional phrase, I am no longer part of the family of God. It's not about simply renouncing your faith. It's about uh, running the other direction. It's about uh, gross sin, about, um, oh man, there's a term in Catholicism about this. What's it called? Deadly sin, I guess. Uh, one of those. The sins that lead to death. It's about those things that actually get you kicked out of the family of God. Um, and and then a complete lack of repentance after that. So let's say you are Paul and you're writing to the Corinthians. And you find that some man has not only began sleeping with a woman out of wedlock, but this woman happens to be his father's wife. That's a gross sin. That's not just gross icky. That's that's like that's like something that God detests. And so what does Paul say about that guy? He says, This is an easy case for you. Kick him out. Deliver him up to Satan so that perhaps with the destruction of his body he might uh, still be redeemed in the spirit. In other words, kick him out. He has committed this gross sin, and if he doesn't repent, then he will never again be able to enter into the family of God because he is out, at least probationally. Or uh, a different P word that I can't really remember. And why is that? Because they cannot again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Or actually, that is what they're doing if they try to do that. Um, <clears throat> and that's actually impossible, as we learn in uh, Hebrews 10, 26. So the point is, when Hebrews talks about sin, it's not talking about like the everyday sins that that send you to purgatory or something like that. It's talking about sins of denying the faith. It's talking about rejecting Jesus and and claiming that he is accursed and unclean. So it is those sorts of things that you cannot again crucify Jesus over and be redeemed uh, from. And this is actually really important because if this is just talking about all sins ever, um, then, you know, you better not sin after you become a Christian. You better not sin at all. Because if you sin just once, you cannot repent because then you're crucifying Jesus all over again. But this also is important. And so it's not that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that there are these gross like major sins that you you uh, can't partake in in order to remain a member of the family of God. But what that also means is when Hebrews is talking about the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sins, what sort of sins is that referring to? That's referring to, to gross uh, covenant-breaking sins. The sorts of sins... That get you cut off from the people of God. It's not talking about like lying. It's not talking about these minor sins that you can actually um, be atoned for through the blood of a bull or goat. And we'll get into that. So this author believes in better things for you. So, but beloved, we are convinced of better things regarding you and things that accompany salvation. So again, this is about salvation. If you sin, you lose your salvation. If you think that this is referring to minor sins, but it's not talking about minor sins, it's talking about uh, cutting you off from the people of God sorts of sins, really major sins. Um, and so, and things that accompany salvation, even though we are speaking in this way. 
For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love with which you have shown toward his name by having served and by still serving the saints. And we desire that each one of you demonstrate the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance uh, of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and endurance inherit the promise. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear no, uh, since he could swear an oath by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For people swear an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath serving as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to demonstrate to the heirs of the promise the fact that his purpose is unchangeable, confirmed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to hold firmly to the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul, a hope both sure and reliable, and one which enters into the veil, for Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Interesting, very interesting stuff. Um, basically, because Jesus doesn't die, because he's our eternal high priest, we have this hope that is sure and unchangeable. Here's another really interesting thing. This hope we have, uh, uh, sorry, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner, oh no, no, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and reliable, and one which enters within the veil. What veil? Good question. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. Um, Let's see, R, we're, yeah, we're inside, inside the veil. So, the veil, the only time in Hebrews that the veil is mentioned again is in uh, verse nine or chapter nine, verse something where God says that uh, Jesus has entered the veil or Jesus or, or Jesus has torn down the veil, which is his flesh. So within the veil is not like the actual veil in the temple of God within the veil is about Jesus flesh. So our, uh, we have a hope both sure and reliable and one which enters within Jesus flesh. So as he dies and is raised again, he still has flesh. That's still kind of the point of his bodily resurrection. Is he bodily resurrected? And so he still has flesh, which means that our hope, even though maybe it might have died when he died, it is raised again when he he is raised again, and it is eternal because Jesus will never die a second time. And so he entered as a forerunner. He entered into his flesh, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now we'll get into Hebrews 7. This is where it starts to get a bit crowded, a bit rowdy, in the discussion between messianics and non-messianics. And I'll just read... Oh, wait, let me see if I have any notes on the previous pass, passage. Yeah, I talked about elementary teachings. Oh, yeah, yeah, this one's interesting. So, for ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So, Origen wrote a... a a commentary on this specific passage. So he describes the rain that falls upon the earth as the doctrine of the law that brings forth the fruit of works. But if it does, quote, but if it does not have a spiritual work, but thorns and thistles, that is cares of the world or the desire of pleasures and riches, it is worthless and near to being cursed. Its end is to be burned. He goes on to say that the one who does good works they obtain a blessing, but if they refuse to do good works and receive the word of God, they will get a curse. And this is uh, a homily on Leviticus 16 to uh, um, verses 4 through 6. Or it's on Leviticus 16 2, and it's paragraphs 4 through 6 that he talks about this. And so Origen here, he's, of course, a really early guy, and he's talking about the law of God, and he's saying, you better keep it. Now, of course, Origen didn't believe that you should keep literally all of the law. I do. But um, at the very least, he is 
continuing the the ancient church tradition that God didn't actually abrogate the law. You are supposed to keep it. The only thing he did was he certain things he fulfilled in such a way that in our daily practice they are transformed. And that's what Origen believed. And we'll talk about that more as we uh as we move forward. And so, okay, so one note I have here is in verses 19 through 20, um, Jesus entered within the veil is interesting because um, he didn't actually ever go into the earthly veil. So which veil is he talking about? He's talking about the heavenly veil, and that's where Jesus ministers. And so that's important because Jesus is the heavenly high priest and he's uh, ministering in the heavenly temple within the heavenly veil, not at all ever within the earthly temple. And so with that, let's move on to chapter 7. So, G so in the previous chapter, it ends with him saying, uh, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And now he's going to continue that line of reasoning, talking about the Melchizedek. And he says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their countrymen, although they are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser person is blessed by the greater, in this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, has paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his forefather when Melchizedek met him. So this is really interesting. Um, in my notes, I should have a... Yep, right here. Okay, so... Uh, this is one of the places where a lot of scholars they get really excited because they're like, look at this. It's like a direct parallel to someone else who said almost the exact same thing. Um, so in Hebrews 5.10 and 7.2, you have this these two sets of quotes, uh, quotes. He says, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. That's 5.10. And then 7.2. He was, first of all, by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. Now, look at Philo of Alexandria in his allegory and Allegorical Interpretations, uh, chapter 3, verse 25, or paragraph 25. No, he does it in verses, so yeah, verse 25. Moreover, God made Melchizedek the King of Peace, that is, of Salem, or that is the interpretation of this name, his own high priest. And so there's like almost a direct parallel between these uh, two lines of reasoning. Now, Philo did not think that the Melchizedek priest was precisely what the author of Hebrews thinks Jesus is. Philo interpreted the Melchizedek priest to be something a bit different, more like this spiritual principle more than anything, or like a logos in a way, um, but it's different. Hebrews interprets the Melchizedek priest to be, yeah, like there's a spiritual principle behind it, but it's Jesus as a person, not as some sort of principle or force. Um, he's a person who in inhabits it. And so one could say that at one time, the spiritual principle, quote unquote, was in force, and it was people who could attain to it. So the original Melchizedek, he attained to the spiritual principle and therefore was able to be called the Melchizedek on earth at the time. David, 
he was called Melchizedek. So he could attain to this spiritual principle. Moses, he was a type of Melchizedek because he's the one who was able to ordain others. He's the only priest at the time who was able to offer all of the sacrifices, yet he was not a Levitical priest. And he was able to ordain Aaron and all the people and bring and usher in the old covenant. Um, he was a Melchizedek priest and he was able to receive and portray the law to the people. Um, so he was a Melchizedek priest. He could attain to that, uh, the Melchizedek principle. And then um, there are other people that you could even think, like Samuel, for instance. He was a priest, yet he was an Ephraimite. Um, Hezekiah, I think. There's another guy. I don't remember. Solomon. He was, he was one of them. Anyway, so you have uh, this interesting way of uh, combining Philo of Alexandria and and the author of Hebrews. Now, most scholars, because of the discrepancies between their thinking, would not say that the author of Hebrews was identical to Philo of Alexandria. So you can't read Philo and say, oh, that's exactly what Hebrews is saying here. That's like Philo, if he says anything on the Melchizedek, just because he says it doesn't mean that is what Hebrews is referring to. But it is interesting that Philo, pre uh, post Christ, I guess he was writing, but pre belief in Christ, because he never believed in Christ, I don't think. He was writing stuff that the author of Hebrews at least was familiar with, at the very least. And probably the author of Hebrews used in his philosophical thinking and transformed it using the lens of Christ. I think that's really what was going on there. And so that's what he did. So for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. So all that stuff. He's just reiterating the, uh, the historical uh, thinking. Or he was reiterating the the biblical history and just telling the people about this. So he was, but this is interesting in verse three. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, who remains a priest perpetually. This is interesting because what is this saying? Is this saying that this first Melchizedek priest was Jesus, and Jesus has been around all along, and he's always been the Melchizedek priest? No, that's not the answer, because this guy was made like the Son of God. He wasn't the Son of God, but he was made like him in typology, and he remains a priest per perpetually. So this is talking about that Philonic principle, the Melchizedekian principle. What George Guthrie says on this in, his, um, in the NIV application commentary, page 254, he says... His point is not that Melchizedek exists as some form of supernatural being. So that's not what the author of Hebrews is saying. Rather, he focuses on the details of what the narrative does and does not say, anticipating a stark contrast between Melchizedek's priesthood and the Levitical priesthood, which he will develop later in the chapter. And so he's using what you could use at uh, consider li literary devices in the Genesis story. And he's saying, look, there's a bit of typology going on here. In the Genesis story, he is without father, without mother. There's no genealogy about him. And here Jesus also is eternal. There, like, yeah, well, there are genealogies of Jesus. So, you know, got you there. Um, it actually, if if this verse is taken literally... Uh, it actually could not uh, be ascribed to Jesus because Jesus has both a father and a mother. But anyway, that's not the point. The whole point is that the Melchizedek priest is one that is more eternal. And the reason for that is because it is at a higher level on the temporal plane. You have the Levitical priesthood, which is on earth, and it is within, let's say, the scope of the universe. Uh, Melchizedek priest is a spiritual priesthood, and so it actually transcends the scope of the universe. And that's the point that it's saying. He remains a priest perpetually. So now observe how great this man who was, who, uh, was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choice spoils. 
and all that sort of stuff. Basically, he's just saying that he, this Melchizedek priest was greater than Le Abraham, and he was greater than Levi by extension because Levi is not greater than Abraham. And so if he's greater than Abraham and greater than Levi, then he's greater than the Levitical priesthood. That's the logical progression he's making. Let me see if I have any notes on this section. So, okay, yeah, so the Melchizedek priesthood, which Jesus perceives as greater than the Levitical priesthood. Eusebius of Caesarea in the 4th century believed that Jesus' Melchizedekian priesthood included who Catholics would call priests. So when Jesus enters into his Melchizedekian priesthood, um, Eusebius in the 4th century thought that this extended to other people. Jesus was the Melchizedek high priest, and the priests, the ministering priests within the churches, were the Melchizedekian other priests. Now, in order to understand that, you have to look at sort of the logistics of the Levitical priesthood when it was on earth. You would have Aaron, the high priest, and his sons operated as uh, helpers to the high priest. Yet his sons were also priests. Uh, Moses ordains all of them as priests. So Eusebius here is building off of that uh, paradigm. So he says, so within the Melchizedek, so he says, our Savior Jesus, quote, the Christ of God now performs through his ministers even today sacrifices after the manner of Melchizedek's. For just as he who was priest of the Gentiles is not represented as offering outward sacrifices, but as blessing Abraham only with wine and bread, so in exactly the same way our Lord and Savior himself first, and then all his priests among all nations, perform the spiritual sacrifice according to the customs of the church and with wine and bread, darkly express the mysteries of his body and saving blood. So this is in proof of the gospel 5.3. So he's not only presupposing that Jesus having being a high priest assumes or infers that there are lower priests. He's also saying that if you look at the the the, the thing that the Levitical or the Melchizedekian priest did in the Genesis story, especially as it's related in Hebrews here, he he receives a tithe and also uh let's see where does it say it doesn't say this here, but in the Genesis uh, story, you know, they have a meal. Why don't we actually go to that? I think it's Genesis 14. Yeah, so what it says here, then after his return from the defeat of Kedorla Omer, Kedorla Omer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the, val uh, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High and blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham. Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and all that stuff. Yeah, so here Melchizedek offers Abram bread and wine. As, because he was a, a priest of God Most High. So that's sort of the spiritual uh, uh, sacrifice that was Melchizedek's. And that's actually really interesting because when you would perform a sacrifice in the, the Levitical priesthood, you would eat of the sacrifice. You would, you would slaughter the lamb, burn it, like bake it and everything on the altar, and then you would eat it. And so what what Eusebius is in yeah what Eusebius is inferring here is if the Melchizedek priest is offering bread and wine to Abram then he is this he's offering the sacrifice that he just gave to God most high to Abram which means the bread and the wine is the sacrifice that he offered that's the Melchizedekian sacrifice which is really interesting um, Paul makes another mention, just going back to the whole idea of Moses being in Melchizedek. 
Paul talks about how Jesus, uh, uh, God gave them bread from heaven, the manna, which was Jesus' body. And God gave them the water from the rock, which was Jesus' blood. And so there is another um, allusion to the bread and the wine that Melchizedek gives. And that's found in this passage here. Now we get to the fun part. Verse 11. Let me take a drink really quick. The author of Hebrews continues. So if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. For the one about whom these things are said belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses said nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a law, a physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is attested of him. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is the nullification of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the introduction of a better hope through which we come near to God, and to the extent that it was not without an oath. For they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. By the same extent, Jesus also has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were uh, prevented by death from continuing. Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who has no daily need, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all time when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever." <clears throat> and that is the 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 sort of finale of the first half of this inclusio and let's break it down so let's <laughs> this, this is actually really interesting and, and, and it's one of those things that you know you look at it and you read it and you're like wow the law is done away with or at least part of it i don't know it's been changed it says here that the law has been changed or it's been uh, there's a nullification of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness because the law made nothing perfect. And you're just like, whoa. Yeah, the law has changed. Now, as a messianic, you would want to dig maybe a little deeper than, you know, the English translation here. So let's begin. So if perfect, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood. Let's stop there. Is perfection through the Levitical priesthood? Well, the answer is no. How do we know? Well, the whole point of this passage is to say what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek. Meaning, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, then there would not be a need for a Melchizedek to come. And so therefore, perfection is through the Melchizedek, not through the Levitical priest. And this is actually also important because the word perfection here uh, let me go to my notes here because I don't remember exactly. Okay, so so uh, so yeah, so uh, where is it? Okay, so perfection. The word for perfection here is teleosis. Um, and so here, as elsewhere in Hebrews, it does not mean without flaws. And that's sort of how we typically think of perfection. 
we think of it as without flaws. And if you are thinking about sin, like going back to the previous discussion about sin, whether it is a every minor sin that that Jesus' death atones for, or whether it's the identity of being a sinful person that Jesus' death atones for, then you could get sort of caught up in the weeds. Maybe it does mean, maybe the word perfection does mean without sin or without flaws, but that's not what it means. So it has more to do with, quote, arriving at a desired end or reaching a goal. And so this is found in, oh man, I have an ibid here. Where's my first ibid? Should be the one right but Oh, wait, okay, so Guthrie says this here. Where did Guthrie speak? Silly Guthrie. No, silly me, because I put an ibid here. Darn it. Well, anyway, Ibid, page 265. I know what that's from. It's from the uh, NIV application commentary on the book of Hebrews by George Guthrie, page 265. So Guthrie says the word perfection is here as elsewhere in Hebrews does not mean without flaws, but has to do with arriving at a desired end or reaching a goal. And the reason that this is actually uh, like, or no, 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 not the reason. One way to verify this, for instance, is you can look at the Septuagint's um, uh, usage of this term. And the word is used 14 times. And the 12 times that, that it's used in the Torah, it's translated as ordination. Both in the Septuagint and in the Hebrew equivalent when we translate from the Masoretic. So it means ordination. And so in this sense, it would seem that Moses perfected, quote unquote, the Levitical priesthood because Moses is the one that ordinate, or ordained the Levitical priesthood. This is sort of why Moses was like a Melchizedek priest, because um, he ordained the Levitical priesthood. But Moses wasn't the, like, Moses was the, 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 the human medium of the ordination of the Levitical priesthood, but he is not the primary actor. God is. God is the one who ordained the Levitical priesthood. Moses simply did the ritual that was required for it. And so, yeah, it's Moses, but it's more God. God is more the one who did it. So um, the perfection comes from God. So in, to put it another way, God or Moses brought Aaron to God's desired end for him. Of course, God did through Moses. Meanwhile, the Levitical priesthood was not able to make the people of God into what God designed them to be. So by implication, Jesus was able to do this. This is part of uh, Okay, so let me see here. I have another. There is, oh, what was it? I think it's in Jeremiah 2.2 2, in the Septuagint version. There's another passage that uses this word for, for perfection or perfected. And it's also really interesting because this word here, actually, in in the other passage, means means something uh, completely different. Um, here it is. Okay. Why are you doing this? Interesting. Don't you love it when your notes malfunction? Okay, I'm going to pause this really quick and I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. So, yeah, the word perfection is used 22 times in total. Uh, the teleos, or teleo, um, teleos is however you want to say it, um, is used 22 times and... Uh, so it typically means to bring to fulfillment or completion. So um, it's used in the New Testament nine times, and then it's used in, uh, and it's used, oh, only in Hebrews. 
I'm sorry, 22 times in the New Testament, nine of those times are in Hebrews alone. So that's found in 2.10, 5.9, 7.19, 28, 9, 9, and 10, 1, uh, and 14, and 11, 40, and 12, 23. And then the nano form is found only twice, once in Hebrews, which is in this passage that we're talking about. And uh, in the Septuagint, the nano form is found 14 times, 12 times in the Torah. So all of which is referring to the ordination of Aaron and his sons. And is found uh, once in Second Chronicles 29.35 regarding the resuming of the temple service. And yeah, once in Jeremiah 2.2. 2. And in Jeremiah, it says... It says uh, uh, Jeremiah 2 2. It says that the people of God, or Israel itself, they were perfect at one point. So let me close this down really quick and I will look at that. So Jeremiah 2 2. Ooh, let's go to parallels. It says in the NIV, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how it, as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. The word for devotion in the Septuagint is translated is the teleo. And it, of course, means perfection. So it, God says in Gen Jeremiah 2.2 2, that I remember the perfection of your youth. I was a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. And that's sort of what's going on here in uh, Jeremiah or or in the word for perfection. And so, the, and so that gets into a question that we'll talk about later. But in the meantime, at the very least, the word for perfection can mean to reach a desired end. It has happened before. But we know that the Levitical priesthood doesn't do it. So if it has happened before and the Levitical priesthood doesn't do it, then that means that someone else had to have. And if God is the one who ordained the Levitical priesthood, then that means God is also the one that brought Israel to its perfection. And that's sort of the point that I wanted to make here. And so if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there for a priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? The answer is uh, there wouldn't have been. And the reason that there wouldn't have been is because the Levitical priesthood would have fulfilled the perfection mandate. But there was a Melchizedek priesthood that was required because perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood, which means the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood are different, and they serve different functions. That's really important. Now, the next section here, for on the basis of the Levitical priesthood, the people received the law. What is that talking about? You know why I need to think to ask that question? So whenever you come to the word law, quote unquote, you actually have to pay a bit more careful attention. Um, where do I have? Okay, so uh, when it's talking about a law, so there are a variety of laws that are possible in the New Testament in the first century a lot of very broad potential usage and it could mean anything from every good law in every nation this is found in the first century in the sibylline oracle uh translation by terry uh, 1899 and is found in uh the uh oracle 12 to um uh, lines or sorry oracle 12 lines 296 to 301 and then also in Oracle 3, lines 753 and 757. And in Oracle 11, lines 106 through 118. So that's part of the first century. That's part of part of what a lot of Christians actually believed was Scripture, the Sibylline Oracles. Um, of course, now we know that they were not really Scripture. And, and in the long run, we didn't consider them Scripture. But a lot of Christians did consider them scripture, and they would have based their understanding of scripture on these oracles. And they thought law, at least in part, was uh, could refer to every good law in every nation. Now, that makes a lot of sense, because all good things are from God, and so if there is a good law, then it comes from God, somehow. 
uh, Philo of Alexandria um, in in On Creation, uh, line 143, he also said something very similar, that natural law is instilled in creation, and if nations are receiving a good law, then they are essentially getting this from God one way or another. But um, every good law in other nations are considered uh, uh, law, quote-unquote. And then you also have this concept in, in First Maccabees, I think it's in chapter 7, where they talk about the Romans, and they say that the Romans exact justice through their laws, and they have a just law. And so law could mean every good law in every nation. Law could also mean the law given by the Sanhedrin. And if you wanted to learn about that in the first century, you can look at Pirkei Avot 1. And then it could mean the law of Moses, which is the one that we just, we assume. And it could also mean the Hebrew Bible in general. For instance, if you look at John 10, 34, Jesus talks about Psalm, a Psalm as the law, quote unquote, so it's necessary to, term, to determine which law Hebrews is referring to in 711. And the only hint that we get is that the law is given under the Levitical priesthood. So first of all, the law of Moses should be removed from the equation because it was not given under the Levitical priesthood. So if you look at the historical, like the biblical timeline, when was the Levitical priesthood ordained? And when did they start actually giving laws? Well, you could say Exodus, what was it, 24? That's when Aaron was sort of giving laws in a way. But he wasn't giving laws as a Levitical priest. He was giving laws as Aaron. So when was he, when did he become a Levitical priest? He was actually ordained in Leviticus 8. And so, at the very least, even if you look, look at verse uh, Hebrews 7.11 and take under the Levitical priesthood, they received the law, in the broadest of, of terms, you have to say that that can only refer to anything after Leviticus 8. Because only after Leviticus 8 were the people under the Levitical priesthood. Otherwise, they weren't. But what should really, the, the reason that we should um, not accept that meaning is because the apparent meaning of under the Levitical priesthood is, should, is more referring to the laws that were given by the Levitical priesthood. And so that would mean the entirety of the law of Moses is not subject to this conversation. Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 7.11 is not talking about the law of Moses. And so, what is this law referring to? So, the word for law is nonomotheditai. That's not the typical word for law, which is nomos. It is a derivative of nomos, nonomotheditai. It's in there, but it isn't actually the same word. And, it, and this one is interesting because it actually just means to enact laws or to legislate. And it's done, it, this word in this particular usage is in the passive sense. And so it, it's uh, in the Thayer lexicon and in the L LSJ, it has basically the same meaning. Laws are enacted or prescribed for one, to be legislated for, or to be furnished with laws. So that's what it means it's to be legislated to, in a sense. And so... What it actually is saying, so the Hebrew word or the Greek word for law there, let me actually go to it so you can see. Let's go to the Greek. Now, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for upon which basis the people received the law, that whole received the law is all one word, ninomotheditai. That's the one that we're talking about, and it means to legislate. So, um, what this should say is upon which, upon the basis of which the people were legislated to. So the Levitical priesthood was legislating to the people of Israel. 
And that's more what we what we're talking about here in in uh, verse eleven. So uh, okay, he so this is actually really interesting because this word is only used twice in the New Testament. Both times are in Hebrews. The second time is in Hebrews eight six, which reads, "But now he Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises." Now the word for enacted there is which is interesting because this isn't like some translation trickery here. It's just, if you don't assume that Hebrews is being careful with its wording, then you can say, well, it uses this rare term only twice, and it means it and it's, it, it means this word in different ways. And so therefore, we're not going to translate it in a way that would make sense to connect them to each other. But they are connected to each other because Hebrews is very intentional with the words that he uses, the author of Hebrews. And so when you read Hebrews 8, 6, you should be reading it in connection to Hebrews 7, 11. And so what is Hebrews 7, 11 and Hebrews 8, 6 saying? Well, to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Should the term nanomathetitai be enacted, or should it be receive the law? The covenant here, which has been, which has received the law on better promises, could be one way of, of saying that, or on the basis of which the people were enacted. That could be another way that you can put that. The answer is, um, well, what do I have the answer here? The answer is that uh, the word is to legislate. It is to um, sort of become ordained, uh, not ordained, to, to ordain laws. And so the way that you should read 711 is, um, for on the basis of which the people were legislated to or they received a, a law, you should read it the same way in Hebrews 8, 6, to the extent that he also is the mediator of a better covenant who was legislated to on better promises. Um, or which was legislated to on better promises. And so, in other words, the distinction between the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedekian priesthood is not a difference in law, but it's a difference in the basis by which the law is, is uh, legislated to the specific covenant. The Levitical priesthood, or and the Old Covenant in, in general, has not as good promises as the New Covenant. And so when you receive the law from Jesus and in the New Covenant, you receive it on these better promises. And this is what it's talking about. So the law actually doesn't change. It doesn't go away. The reason for us keeping the law changes. And the better promises, the promises that we can rely on, change. Our hope changes. That's what it's saying. Okay, so what other notes do I have here? So the two priesthoods did not fill the same role. So if if we are to assume that they did, the priesthood of Aaron would have... Okay, so this is what the, the passage is saying. If perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, we uh, the people received the law. What further need was there for a priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? I already covered that. Um, I covered that. Okay. So this verse if you just take it at like face value without any sort of background reading, um, it would seem to imply that the Levitical priesthood had the job to bring Israel to perfection, and then it just failed to do so. And so God had to use sort of like plan B as the Melchizedekian priesthood. I don't think that's what the interpretation of the verse is. It, it, it was actually not the job of the, Levitic, of the Levitical priesthood to bring the people of Israel to perfection from the beginning. It just wasn't. Jesus was always the one who was going to do this, and so it was never the job of Aaron. And so that means that the the passage Hebrews seven eleven is more a rhetorical question. 
He's saying, if this happened, then why did we need the Melchizedekian priesthood? The answer is, the Levitical priesthood wasn't bringing perfection. That was never its role. And so therefore, it was always the Melchizedekian priesthood's role. And so, Nenomotheditai, it is to be legislated to. That's what it means. Uh, going back to which law actually it is referring to. So we are cutting out the law of Moses. It doesn't make any sense because that um, the law of Moses was like almost the entirety. Of, no, no. All of it was given not by the Levitical priesthood, but by Moses. And it was given from God through Moses. And so the law that the Levitical priest, priesthood gives is actually just the law of the Sanhedrin. And so to understand that, we sort of have to understand the uh, the Torah's ju judicial system and legislative system. So in Exodus 18, 13 through 26, Moses establishes a graduating judicial system where men selected by Moses are given the capacity to try cases. Uh, quote, Moses chose, uh, chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Then they judged the people at all times. They would bring the difficult matters to Moses, but they would judge every minor matter themselves. This is verses 25 through 26. And, and then Moses recalls this in Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18. Basically, the people elect who they want, and then Moses appoints them. And there's some divine election going on as well. And so there's this graduating level of courts, or graduating hierarchy of courts. That's part of this legislative system. Now you could say, well, this is a judicial system. It's not a legislative system. That is true. But in those days, the judges were the legislators as well. So it's kind of a distinction without a difference. On top of that, if you look at the way that our law in America works, we have um, we operate on this thing called common law. And in common law, what you do is you have like base, like a premise that's the law. And then this law is a bit confusing because some people just made stuff up. And so some person tries to find a loophole around it. And someone else sues that person. And they have to refer back to this law in order to understand if this person violated it. Because maybe he did, maybe he didn't. And so in the process of this judicial, in this judicial process, the violation of the law is either determined or whatever this person did is either determined to be a violation of the law or to not be a violation of the law. Thus, it is um, clarifying what the law says. That's uh, that's how common law works. Now, in this process, this bit of precedent that's set in this in this judgment becomes uh, it it has the weight of law. Now, anybody who does this thing and breaks this law, actually breaks this law, um, if they also do what this person did. So the clarification uh, has the weight of law. And so the distinction of judicial and legislative in the Torah would be a distinction without a difference, and it's also a distinction without a difference in our day, too. Um, in our day, yeah, the judges don't just write laws, that's for, that's for sure, but they interpret it. And so, and so there's this graduating set of uh, judges. So, uh, but it's a little more complex. And we talked about in Exodus 24. So God tells Moses to bring 70 elders from Israel, as well as Aaron and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu. This is verse one. These 70 elders, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, approach God with Moses. Verse two, uh, verse one. While Moses alone is told to approach fully, and that's in verse two. And when Moses goes up to the top of the mountain to receive the law from God in verses 12 and 13, he gives authority to Aaron and her to answer legal questions, verse 14. And these are the same people who hold up Moses' hands at the Battle of Amalek in Exodus 17, 12. And so the wording is important here. Moses is going to receive the law from God. And God says, come up to me on the mountain and stay there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments, which I have written for their instruction in verse 12. And then in verse 14, he says, and Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, have him approach them. 
So the law was given to Moses, and while Moses is gone, in Moses' absence, Aaron and her are given the authority to interpret the law. That's really important. And so the question, so, so you have this graduating hierarchy of judges. At the highest level, you have the 70 elders and, and Aaron and her. So that is the basis for the Sanhedrin. That's found in Jesus' day, which is a court of 70 elders. But what happens if Moses is taken away? What happens if Aaron then interprets the law improperly? in a way that diverges from what Moses would have said had he been there. Well, we're, we're going to return to that in a second. Um, to reiterate, in Numbers 11, 14 through 17, and 24 through 25, uh, sort of gives this set of 70 elders um, the... Or Moses gives these set of 70 elders part of Moses' spirit in order to bear the burden of the people with Moses. And so Moses, being the highest court in the land, then gives part of a spirit to the, to the Sanhedrin, essentially. And then you have the, the graduating courts. And so what if uh, Moses is taken out of the picture? Now, this is actually an important question because Moses, of course, is taken out of the picture. Um, and Deuteronomy is his last set of um, speeches to the people of Israel to help them help guide their way. And so, what 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 does he say? While he's gone, he says this in Deuteronomy seventeen, uh, verse eight, verses eighteen through thirteen. He says, "If a case is too difficult for you to decide between one kind of homicide or another, between one kind of lawsuit or another, and between one kind of assault or another." That are cases of dispute in your courts, and you shall arise and go up to the place where the Lord your God chooses, Jerusalem, the temple. So you shall come to the Levitical priests and the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall inquire of them, and they will declare to you the verdict. So they replace Moses as the highest court in the land, but they don't receive all of Moses's authority. They just they become the highest court because Moses is gone. And so it goes on to say, in, um, in accordance with the terms of the law, which they instruct, you shall do. And uh, um, and that if you disobey, so that's verse 11, and if you disobey the law that they are giving you, it's a capital crime. You're going to die. That's verses 11 through 13. So this is really interesting because... There, the word nonomothetitai is found in two places. So going back to our conversation, what is nonomothetitai in um, Hebrews 7.11? This is the law that is given by the Levitical priesthood. It's found in two places in the Torah. One place is in uh, Exodus 34, verse I forgot. And then the second place is actually here in Deuteronomy 17.10. And it references... The law that the Levitical priest or, or judge legislates for the people. So if we... Oh, I... Okay, so if we, let's say, go to, let's say, Blue Letter Bible, and we go to Septuagint, and we go to figure out what this word is, which is Strong's 3549. Totally remembered that. Okay, so let's go there. LXX, and we go G3945. Pretty sure. Is that right? 3945? 3549. Yeah, I got it backwards. Okay, G. 3549. So this gets us to Nenomotheteo, and that's the same word that we're using. So in uh, Exodus or Deuteronomy 17.10, what it says here is, um, uh, where is it? Got a... uh, so Panta Asa Ein Nenomothet Tithi Soi. 
So what he's saying in all the uh, all the verdict that you are be legislating to. Now this is uh, interesting. The Septuagint used basically a word for word translation from the Hebrew when it was doing this, which means that when you see the number thirty as the last word in a verse, you can actually go to um, the Hebrew. And you can look at the last word in that verse, and it's it corresponds to that last word. So let's go to Deuteronomy 17.10. And let's go to the Hebrew. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Not that one. Let's go to the interlinear. So this is interesting. Um, so it says, Le'asot kakol asher. Yoruha. They order you. That's the word that's being translated with nonomatheditai. That is uh Hebrew the H 3383, which or 3384, which is Yaha. And that is to throw or to shoot. That's what the word literally means. But sort so it means to like point out, to teach, to set things between things to teach and to cast and to show and all that sort of stuff. That's what is meant when, when, uh, or that's the word that is being translated as the nomothetic type. Now, of course, yaha does not always only mean to legislate or to uh, point out or to show. It means a variety of other things. When yaha means to legislate, that's when it means, that's when it's translated as the in the, uh, in the Septuagint. The other really interesting thing is Nanomathetitai is never used to translate the word Torah, which is what you would is the term that you would use to refer to the law of Moses specifically. Now by inference, you can say that some like a lot of times Yaha can be referring to the law of Moses because it's like the Yaha of God. It's the instruction of God. Um but it is not the word for Torah. It is the word. It's a different word. And so when we read that, we should not be reading as the law of Moses specifically, but more of a broad term is what's being referenced here. But in the Septuagint, this is the uh, one of the places that Nanomathetitai is used, which is Deuteronomy 17.10. And so that means that when we're reading, when we're learning about Nanomathetitai and what it means, we should be referencing this passage as part of it. This passage is referring to the law given by the Levitical priesthood after the death of Moses. So when Hebrews says that the law was given or, or under the Levitical priesthood, you received the law, you were legislated to, the law that is being referred to is the law given by the Levitical priesthood. And that means that when you read the word law, until it changes until it explicitly changes to something else, you should be assuming that it's referring to the law given by the Levitical priesthood. And that's just one of the basic hermeneutical principles. Now with that, I'm going to end this. So we'll pick up in Hebrews 7 verse verses 12 through 17 in my notes next time because it's getting late so uh you can tell it's a lot darker than when i started so anyway i'm having fun here i hope you are too uh, if you have any questions i know i was uh sort of going around in circles a little bit there but if you have any questions feel free to ask and um yeah if you, please like comment and subscribe and um if you disagree with me or if you agree with me, I'd love to hear from you. And so, yeah. Oh, and share this video with your friends, especially those who um, disagree with me because I love talking to people who disagree with me. Anyway, I hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, be blessed. And yeah, continue to study the word and to take it all seriously. Amen.